Uh, good morning. Um, quick up here, um, yeah, a few house rules. The, the main thing is, um, you know, let's say in a week when we've been reminded that safety in our industry is quite an important topic, uh, we need to make our own contribution to that by being aware of what happens should the alarms go off. There are no plans for a fire drill here, so if it does go off, uh, if the fire alarm does go off any time in the next uh, three or four hours, uh, it's a real thing. Uh, there are three exits marked here, and there are exit routes. You know, there's, there's follow-up um, signs that will take you out into the um, open area that's between us and the Royal Academy, and we assemble there and wait for further instructions. Uh, with that, uh, Gary, if you could put the first of my slides up. Really, this one is just to say welcome to this, which is our ninth um, forum. Uh, we started them back in October 2008, and we're actually beginning to be able to do them one a month apart from the sort of July and August month where we decided everybody needs a holiday including us. Uh, but one a month, um, range of topics, typically ranging from advanced geophysics through to um, through integration, collaborative technologies, uh, intelligent energy, through to exploration uh, topics such as uh, we had a pretty successful forum on Iraq back in November and today we're looking at the um, issue of unconventional gas, particularly, particularly shale gas. Just as a reminder, I mean I know it doesn't stop anybody taking notes uh, during the day, uh, but if you wish to you can because we are being videoed and um, if you wish you can simply sit back um, and watch the video recordings uh, in a week or so's time. And they are, I think, pretty good. You get an image of the speaker on one screen and then his or her changes of slide are synced with the presentation. So it all works pretty well now. And you can access those uh, via our website, as I say, in a w about a week. So um, no need to scribble. The, uh, the other implication of um, being videoed is that if you wish to ask a question, uh, just wait for Carl uh, to come to you with one of these microphones here that's uh, on the table. Um, the other thing to say is um, to make sure, or to try and help you decide not to leave before lunch, uh, we do have a raffle draw at, uh, oh, it'll be at about 12.50, 12.55, something like that. So don't throw away the raffle ticket. Uh, that's attached to your program or leave it lying around as somebody did the winning ticket about uh, three forums ago. And um, Today we have three prizes. They're all the same. They're one of these uh, 160 gig uh, storage devices about the size of an iPod. Sort of a bit more storage than a UBS stick. Uh, but uh, you could get... Uh, you can get... How many? tunes on here or videos, 15,000 or something like that, if you want to, but worth winning. Okay, um, so today's theme um, is unconventional gas, particularly shale gas. And um, you'll all be aware, and I'm sure that's the reason you're here, that this is a topic that's risen um, up uh, the, the agenda over the last year, 18 months, two years, to the point at which the Times was able to uh, agree to take notice of it about uh, three weeks ago. And they actually wrote a fairly um, bullish article about it, um, focused on the potential for shale gas in, in Poland, uh, actually, but suggesting that... Um, you know, this would displace uh, Russia's grip on uh, European energy supplies and um, all sorts of other things. So, 
what we've done today is an assemble in a, an agenda which looks at uh, what is this American technology um, that um, the Times chose to pick up on. Um, what lessons can be learned from the US experience? Uh, where we might go in Europe or close to Europe to find potentially similar accumulations and um, perhaps how such gas would fit into the, uh, the world market, uh, perhaps particularly bearing in mind that the cost of producing such gas is roughly about double what you can get for it uh, in the market at the moment. Um, and some of the issues connected with estimating gas resources and reserves in unconventional traps in any case. So I thought I would begin by talking about the technology um, briefly. You can see actually in the bottom line I expressed the, the opinion and it is really just my opinion that the technology is not the issue. Uh, the technology is merely incremental um, and the issue is finding rocks which one contain the gas and two will actually work when confronted with this uh, incremental technology. Um, if you were to go on to the um, ELG resources uh, website, uh, put aside for the moment the slight hesitation when you realize that the E in EOG actually stands for Enron and actually assume that this is a completely different transformed company, uh, they have a 250 page uh, PDF file on their website that tells you all you will ever wish to know uh, about the technology behind unconventional gas and oil extraction in the US. Uh, down, starting with the sort of mega scale of enormous fracking jobs and down to uh, very many pictures of the poor strokes of producing shells. Sort of encyclopedia of, of this topic. And I have um, stolen one or two of their pictures. Uh, no, I need to point at that, don't I? So this is the first one. Uh, just as an illustration of the um, the type of drilling and completions technology that we're talking about. So number one, uh, long horizontal sections of wells uh, and then compounding that with multilateralism. So a vertical borehole with several wells, several horizontal arms uh, coming out from it. And then uh, a very large number of hydraulic frack jobs along that uh, horizontal section. Um, I'll show you a slide in a minute um, which sort of summarizes the change but a few years ago it was unusual to have more than two or three frack jobs in a horizontal well now uh, these companies are talking about 10, 12, 15 uh, much more complex uh, jobs and this is just a sort of combined uh, plot uh, by uh, EOG resources which says here's basically what we do drill vertically, multilaterals, horizontal wells, a dozen or so uh, stages of hydraulic fracking um, the picture on the right actually says and we can be a bit tricky with lease boundaries and legal limits and how close you can get to boundaries and uh, get a couple of extra frack jobs in and push our production up and that's all it's really trying to say, it's not a different picture in a sense it's not saying we're so smart we can drill bendy wells, it's just sort of pushing the legal boundaries of licenses to the limit. Um, what this fracking enables you to do, and they do have a history, summary history, the same file that I referred to, talking about the evolution of completion technologies from in the case of purely vertical holes from what happened in the century before last um, and summarizing in each case uh, what was the area contacted uh, uh, in square feet uh, for those of you who don't remember a foot is about one of those 
Uh, and how much oil is, and in particular, what sort of permeability these jobs enable you to extract from. So, uh, back in the old days where you needed uh, a milidati plus to see a successful completion, to now they're claiming with horizontal wells, you can, with a many-stage uh, complex frack uh, of today, um, uh, access huge areas in terms of square feet and get down to extraordinarily low permeabilities which then start producing. So, you know, a good story, stretching the technology in a big way. Um, what I meant by what I said at the beginning was it is stretching the technology but it's no more new science than the Airbus that carries 600 people is a new concept in transport. It's just bigger, more of it you know, bigger engines, bigger jobs, more complex. One of the things that these, um, I'll just go back one. When you're undertaking that kind of horizontal well, and that an absolute key is to find a shale that is already fractured and has competent shale above and below to constrain the frack. So you need to be performing the frack in something that will, will fracture, but you need competent rock above and below to actually restrain the frack to the producing zone. Which brings me to the point that it's kind of appropriate we're meeting here in the Geological Society today because actually the rocks are the key to this, not the uh, drilling and completion technology. Let me move on. One more. <coughs> if you, this is actually off the website of my, uh, well the pictures are off the website of my former employer, British Petroleum. Um, and what this is saying is that you can actually uh, use fairly conventional seismic technologies, familiar seismic technologies to, um, excuse me, to chase down these um, rock sweet spots. Uh, two or three different things, actually all of which we've talked about as topics here in the previous, in the, in previous forums in the past year or so. Um, more complex acquisition or seismic uh, viral size patterns use of wireless technology, wide azimuth and multi azimuth um, uh, layouts leading to your inability to detect seismic fractures or detect fractures with the seismic method. Again, all pretty standard stuff, um, but um, um, more costly than conventional 3D. Just going on then, and I'm sorry, this slide hasn't, these slides, particularly the green bit, haven't come out as well as I, I'd hoped or intended. But two things on costs. I mean, the typical, and this is an experience in the Haynesville Shale in the States, uh, for a typical well, uh, you t you're looking at uh, well costs. Remember, these are complex, multilateral, horizontal, highly fracked, <coughs> highly complex fracked jobs. Well costs in the range seven and a half to ten million dollars. And then you put on top of that operating costs of two, two and a quarter uh, dollars per MCF. Um, thus, for most of what we're talking about, uh, the typical producing costs are seven and a half or eight dollars per MCF. The, uh, hey, uh, the Henry Hub price today is, where is it, four dollars? So there is an issue here which we need to examine. The other one almost is significant I think, and these are a couple of <coughs> quotes from the um, Chesapeake um, big uh, unconventional gas producer in the States um, from their website and their um, most recent I think analyst presentation uh, 
drilling a typical deep well of the sort I described requires somewhere between 65 and 600,000 gallons of water. Fracking it and you know, putting water in mixed with um, frac fluids and propants requires something like four and a half million, which is, I think, in the range of quite a lot. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how many baths you would fill with four and a half million gallons, but the issue seems to be, one, you have to find it somewhere, and two, you have to dispose of it somewhere when it's got these uh, remnant uh, frac uh, chemicals and propants, well, perhaps the propants have all stayed in the reservoir. So, very emotive issues that are actually wandering their way through the con Congress and various uh, state legislatures at the moment, which are how do you find these rocks and keep well away from aquifers and other sensitive things. So, a couple of big issues connected with or observing the American experience, which are how the hell do you make money out of this if the price, the cost base relative to the price is what I said, and two, what about all this environmental stuff? Okay, what we've done therefore is compose an agenda which uh, looks at some of these questions, um, looks at the US, looks at Europe, uh, looks at how you should estimate resources and reserves in these sorts of rocks. But actually we begin with um, uh, a paper from uh, Bernstein Research by Oz Clint, who's going to talk about um, looking at unconventional resources in Europe and how they fit in.